everybody and welcome to Attempts at Governance. This is episode 23, uh, meaning we've almost done this for half a year, which is pretty amazing. Uh, welcome back to um, some, uh, some of the standard uh, guests here on the panel. We got Limo and Funky on the panel, but we're also joined by Adam and Sam so far today. They're coming in with two super interesting conversations, which we'll get to just after the media spends. But first, as usual, we're going to start with the state of the treasuries. Uh, just a shout out to the guys at Subsquare. Um, you know, they've added this new open gov spend pie chart, which is kind of interesting. So we can see a breakdown of spends based on the track. Um, so that's neat. But uh, over here in the Kusama treasury, we are uh, sitting with a balance of 350,725 KSM on the 30 day moving average. That's worth about $12.78 million. We can expect by this time next week to burn 690 KSM, worth about 2,500. Oh, here's Safari. And uh, an income of about 2,578 KSM, worth about $94,000. And we'll have to see what the spends are by this time next week as well. Over on the Polkadot Treasury, we're sitting with a balance of 44.15 million dot on the 30-day moving average, worth about... 290.5 million dollars and no burns or spends by this time next week but an income of 372,876 dot worth 2.45 million US dollars and uh we're going to throw it right away to the state of the funk funky how are you today I am great thank you so much the state of the funk is always most excellent got another day another gift so happy to be alive but um Wanted to give a shout out to, we've been having a lot of conversations around interoperability thanks to Sama Knights and getting some of the Cosmos folks on there and then near later on. And in my explorations of the Cosmos, I've been having a lot of interesting conversations. And I wanted to give a shout out to the head of the corporation, Rarma. For those of you who are fans of interoperability, I just dropped the link in the chat if you wanted to read a sort of an overview of the Cosmos hub. But one of the things I found most interesting in my journeys over there is that they're having very similar governance struggles. Um, so things that are, are happening here in Polkadot, it seems like community concerns are also being brought up over there too. And so just, you know, for anybody, it seems like we're all interested in decentralization and interoperability. So that's a great primer that Rarma put together if you wanted to read through it and you didn't know anything about the history of Cosmos. So there you go, there's the state of the funk. Thanks, Funk. What are some of the issues that you're finding that are similar between our governance structures and theirs? So, you know, there, it, it apparently just when you think about like we have a treasury that people can propose for and that seems to be the big sticking point that certain proposals are automatically rejected if this, like apparently there are older validator sets from when the chain first started and they're kind of gatekeeping a lot of these proposals and allowing things to go through or not go through. And so the community is getting frustrated by this. Um, apparently there's some conflicts of interest because one of the major ones that Rama mentions kind of it keeps directing a lot of the funding toward itself and it's supposed to be something where it's you know there's a big controversy right now about a public good that seems to be struggling to get funding so you know i don't want to get too far into the deep water but it's just interesting the parallels that we're seeing between polka dot you know and just some of the concerns that people have over you know paying for for public infrastructure just like they're having over there in cosmos too so right right and we don't have the same situation with validators here on on polka dot and kusama but we do have incumbent people who are early and they control a lot of the vote right yeah very similar situation in the sense that um you know because they have been around for a long time they've accumulated a lot of governance power through the token ownership so mm -hmm. you know we're seeing something similar over there and what they're really trying you know because j just like our community is calling for you know, just some organic growth from ideas that are coming from the community itself and just trying to broaden the base of knowledge. It's the same thing that's happening over there where the community wants to be more involved, but they feel as if their voice isn't being heard because they're because of the gatekeeping that's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we'll talk about this a bit further in the show here, but I, I was thinking that there's kind of this, there's a lot of proposals to make the treasury more efficient. I feel like there's this spectrum. On one side, you have bureaucracy and gatekeeping. And then on the other side, you have like... Um, collaborative wealth building and like you know social initiatives and I, I kind of like every proposal or discussion that's going on i kind of like put it on the spectrum and it's an interesting development so anyway thanks very much for the state of the funk there funky and good to have you back 
Uh, okay, we're going to throw it to Limo real quick, and he's going to go over some recently passed referendum, ones that we're going to keep an eye on in coming shows. Go ahead, Limo. Hey, guys. So, yeah, on the media front, we have referendum number 90 from my friend and fellow Chaos Down member LV. He got uh, 2,147 KSM for six months of funding for the Spanish Content Guild. Uh -huh. So, congratulations to him. I'm looking forward to a lot of Spanish content coming out of that guild. Um, from the infrastructure side of things, we have supercomputing systems, uh, referendum number 88. They were uh, awarded with 2,515 KSM for the maintenance of their substrate API client from February to April 2023. So congrats to them. And then we have referendum number 98, which was on the whitelisted caller track, uh, submitted by Joe from Parity. And that was to upgrade system parachains to version 9370 system parachains of what was previously called common good parachains. And then on miscellaneous, we have um, a referendum in the root track, uh, referendum number 86, which was to free some KSM stuck in a corrupted staking state and make it transferable, which is good that that passed. And then we have one that I'm sure will make our good friend Alice and Bob very happy, uh, referendum number 95 to lease swap uh, Karura and Mangata. Uh, passed successfully, so that's good for them. They will not break. And then we have uh, a continuation of the uh, auction saga, referendum number 96 to schedule the second uh, Kusama Parachain auction of the year was uh, enacted. And now there is a new referendum, number 103, to, I believe, enact some more auctions, but it's an ongoing saga, and let's hope it works. All right, thanks very much. And I think uh, Raul is busy with the auction scheduling uh, this week. Hopefully he can join us later in the episode. But if you're wondering where he is, uh, he is still untying that knot. So thanks very much, Limo, for that breakdown. And um, we'll definitely check those out uh, in the future. Uh, moving on to media spends this week. Um, just a few interesting things happening. So this bounty, bounty number 16, that was opened uh, for Spanish content. And this was created by uh, Spanish... What are they called? Oh, ambassadors. Polkadot ambassadors. Sorry. Word just slipped my mind. Spanish ambassadors. So this is to actually assign curators for that chunk of treasury that was taken out and dedicated to these initiatives. That's going through right now, passing uh, with very little resistance. Uh, we have uh, the GMI crypto media. So we had uh, Rich on the show last week. Uh, definitely a huge conversation. Uh, right now, this is sitting at 33% in favor. I saw get as high as 36% this week, but um, it seems trapped here. Uh, this is going to settle in two and a half days, so we'll see about that. Um, I don't know if anybody on the panel has any comments about this, or we've talked about it enough. But um, the other things going through are, oh, this is a really interesting one. So this is by Niftesti. Um, he's, is he, is he bopper on Chaos now there, Limo? Is he in there? I think so. Yeah, he's a, he's a big guy in WAG Media as well, but he also works on the uh, Governance NFT project. And uh, he's out here wanting to create an educational platform specifically for developers. Um, this was in discussions for a while. And uh, oh, who's coming in here? Georgia. Hey, Georgia. Hey. How's it going, buddy? Uh, uh what are you here to talk about? Oh, um, I'm here to do Bugs Yanoi. I'm with um, Safari DAO. Okay. All right. Sweet. Thanks for joining. We're going to get to you guys in just a bit. Uh, anyway, so um, they're looking for quite a chunk of change here. 11, uh, sorry, 1193 KSM uh, for this project. Or I'm sorry, 1492 KSM for this project. And uh, that's passing without much problem. Uh, we also have the Kusama Chaka Bars, which have come back from the dead with a fresh referenda referendum uh, passing uh, with flying colors. Everybody's pretty stoked about that now, uh, myself included. And then we have the One Tribe Radio. Uh, this We had these guys on the show a few weeks ago. Uh, they want to do a 24-hour African radio and television station. And um, they worked really hard to get this proposal through. This is up for motion with the, uh, the polka dot counselors. And uh, just with two days left, they've only had two votes so far, which is, um, you know, kind of on the line there. But I also want to point out that the other two motions up for vote 
have also received very few votes, and all of these are uh, resolving within two days. So uh, hopefully the polka dot counselors can uh, can check out these three referendum so, referenda soon, and uh, hopefully we can get OpenGov going even sooner. Um, but I, I do hope the uh, counselors are paying attention because we also have the Kusumar in six month maintenance funding, uh, sitting pretty, relaxed, moisturized in its lane, focused, waiting to be put up for motion as well. Uh, it's in the queue, and um, hopefully we get some good uh, responses from the counselors there because we had great responses from the community. Um, we put a whole change log of the entire proposal based on everybody's feedback, uh, and that's uh, in the document as well. And um, the, uh, the only other thing that's going on, which I don't think we're going to speak about this week, but it's milestone four for the, uh, the uh, VR Kusama and Polka Dot gallery experience. Um, they're looking to fund the fourth milestone for about a quarter million dollars from the Kusama Treasury. But um, hopefully we can have some guys from there come up and talk to us soon. And um, this leads us to kind of a more general conversation about funding grassroots team. Uh, Sam uh, is on the show this week because he, he opened this discussion, I don't know, Sam, how many weeks ago? Maybe two or three weeks ago. Uh, yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, on the polka dot discussion here. And um, why, don't you, why don't you start with just a quick overview for our audience on uh, what you're trying to achieve how by opening started. this discussion. Yeah, how yeah. it all started. Yeah, so I guess if we go back to... 2020 and 2021 there is uh it's quite a big rush when it comes to um uh parachain right there we had almost the highest uh bid for a crowd loan back in with Akala, right and since then things have kind of steadily been going down the cost of winning a slot has steadily gone down yeah uh, and that's i mean that's a good thing for for parachains but uh conversely on the other side is uh, there are find a lot of teams are finding it really difficult to get funding right now. Uh, you don't hear a lot about uh, uh, you know teams leading rounds with different VCs, and also the Polkadot ecosystem has a very close knit group of VCs. So you'll see the same VCs investing in 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 various uh, projects. Now that's an issue when it comes to uh, driving adoption, right? Because I think through conversations within the ecosystem, the underlying problem we always talk about is user adoption, the number of users that we have on on, on Polkadot and on Kusama, um, and what can people do with the parachains, but also the fact that we need new builders, we need new, uh, new, new resolutions for the UX issues that we have every time we're talking about different multi-sigs. But to fund these new builders, we need an avenue to be defined and 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 we need a way of identifying what a grassroots team is right and whether or not they should get funding from from the treasury hmm. now for a very long time um the underlying uh unwritten rule i guess you would say is parachain teams should not get funding from the treasury right that changed recently with uh with, in buenos aires when when uh, gav and raul were on stage and you know Gav's idea that the parachain team should be just another entity that opens up the conversations of should new builders uh, or or grassroots teams come to the treasury for funding and and and, and that's what I'm here to talk about. Interesting, interesting. Um, yeah, my I'll open up to the panel, but my only comment on this is that. I don't really understand why this is such a big conversation because it seems that, <laughs> sorry, no, but it just seems that anybody who wants to, no matter where you're from, add value and utility to the underlying relay chain Agreed. token, it doesn't, yeah, I don't understand. It just seems if you're going to add value or utility to the token, then sounds good to me. But yeah. uh, let's maybe open it up to some uh, of the panel and then uh, we can dig in. What, what are some thoughts on this around the panel? I can jump in here. So I think it really depends on the project. Um, I'm definitely all for bootstrapping parachain projects using treasury funds. I think if if a project is truly grassroots, they don't have any other, uh, other funding sources and really don't have any other avenues, then by all means, just to get some funds in there to ignite their project, uh, great. 
I think where the controversy comes in is when, when a project has a revenue model. So if your project has a revenue model, then you're essentially asking the ecosystem to bootstrap a for-profit endeavor. And so people might not really want that. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. a capitalist. If, if you build something great for the Kusama ecosystem, I think, great, take your profits. You deserve them. Um, but I definitely understand uh, from a perspective of, you know, managing the Kusama treasury funds, you don't necessarily want to give it to a project that's going to be raking in a bunch of money later on. And I've seen proposal be proposals before where um, it was actually like a loan. So when Akala yeah. got funding for, um, what was it, their liquidity pools or something like that, uh, that was actually a, a loan and they're paying that back. I mean, I haven't tracked the, if they've been paying it back or not, but um, they said that they would. So uh, I guess maybe projects can be clever in coming up with, I guess, uh, you know, faith-based lending agreements. Um, and then another thing I would say is like, yes, VCs are definitely quiet right now. They're not looking to invest in crypto with everything that's going on. Um, but I do know that Parity Technologies and uh, the Web3 Foundation are eager to fund projects. And uh, I think that private source of funding, if you work with uh, Parity or the Web3 uh, Foundation, then I think they'd help you in orienting your project so that it is best for uh, you know the blockchain, uh, for the relay chain, uh, and really help you with your pallets and to make sure that you're doing everything correctly and give you that foresight when you need to open XEM channels. Um, so I think that, I think for projects, for grassroots parachain projects, go to the Web3 Foundation, see if you can work with them to get a grant. Um, if they're being, if they think they need more from you, you know, develop your team, build it a little bit more, and then maybe ask for a modest funding amount from the Kusama treasury. Um, nothing insane but enough to just get your project going for like six months. So you can kind of prove yourselves to VCs or even the web three foundation to show that, Hey, we're dedicated. So, um, and then also just make sure that you're, you know, if there is a revenue model for your business, be absolutely transparent. Uh, people don't like it when you don't share that you're going to make money on something. Uh, and if they find that out, then people will be upset. So, uh, I think just be as transparent as possible. Um, yeah. So those are my thoughts. Sam, what do you think about that? So, well, if we put numbers to this, right, uh, everything Adam said, I agree with. Um, the Web3 Foundation, and um, not necessarily Parity, but specifically the Web3 Foundation, does a lot of work in not only helping builders um, identify where what they're trying to solve, how it fits into the ecosystem, and, and really getting you in contact with the right people. It's absolutely a great start. However, building a parachain and, and the costs allowed to it, if you just talk about substrate developers or Rust developers, it's significant, right? And that's fine if you're incentivizing builders who are already coders. But if you have someone who has an idea and has to hire people, that's where it gets slightly different. The Web3 Foundation might get you a grant. You might be able to deliver on that grant but it won't take you longer than uh, two or three months. The underlying thing we're trying to define, just like we have guidelines where Adam was talking about the liquidity guidelines and defining how should the treasury uh, fund uh, liquid liquidity for other DEXs. We're trying to define standards or guidelines for parachains and, and the dApps being built on top of those parachains to define the value they bring to the ecosystem and whether or not the community and hence the treasury should fund them. That's what we're trying to identify here. Can we agree on common guidelines to fund grassroots teams when the current VCs won't or when they don't have alternatives? Because the alternative, if you don't fund these teams is, you know, they, they just don't build here and they go build where, where they will get supported. Is that fair? Funk, you got anything? Yeah, and it's really interesting how timely this was brought up. And 
is there's another Cosmos connection. Just as I was going through some YouTube stuff last night, I happened to click on a little short with Ian Bellina from Token Metrics, and he was talking about why people go to Cosmos over Polkadot. And the thing he said was a lot of times they have trouble getting funding to get their chain up and running on Polkadot. It's much easier and you need far less runway to do it on Cosmos. So like just an interesting tie in that we're talking about this. I mean, I agree largely with what you guys were saying too. I, I think the real, you know, especially if you take those initial steps to get the web three foundation grant and stuff like that, because then you're kind of getting sort of the, the stamp of approval from W3F. And that I think is going to send big, you know, because that way, if it does come to the point where you need to ask for that six months of funding to give you that runway as a team, you know, the community is going to see that you've already sort of been approved in some sense by Web3 Foundation. It's not like you're just some random blockchain project who's coming, oh, look, we're here to build on Polkadot. That would send up a lot of red flags, and you are just trying to grift the tre treasury. But I think if you take those necessary steps and prove that, you know, hey, we're here to stay, and we have something that, especially if the community is all behind, like if it's providing some kind of public good, then absolutely, I think it's something that should be considered. Yeah, so... Here, we, in the discussion, that's up, and if, Jay, if you're able to open it up at some point. Um, what's really interesting is, uh, it was Alex from Munich Network who said, look, social, uh, Subsocial have a, 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 a proposal up, the Remark team have a proposal up. Now, these, these, these teams or these proposals can get quite contentious. I understand the politics behind them because from the Treasury's perspective, you don't want to show favoritism towards one team or the other. But at the same time, if you look at the teams that are actually shipping and delivering uh, and, and you realize, hang on, they're blocked. So what should we do? Whether or not they want to build something, look at what the Invarch team did about, hey, we're kind of blocked right now, but what we can do is build this multisig, which will also help us with our runway. That's value driven to the ecosystem. That's something that you know people in the ecosystem, people in the community could use. And we yeah. all know the pain points around UX. So absolutely, giving or incentivizing builders to come to the Polkadot ecosystem or identifying that the treasury could potentially help you is extremely important. Hey, uh, Zyla, welcome to the show. Do you have a comment on this or are you just uh, you just joining in now? Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, hi, Al. Hey. Uh, I actually have a comment on this. Great. Um, I specifically joined into that. Um, but yeah, I think it, all of these uh, proposals that come from uh, ecosystem teams, I mean, they, they could encompass everything that has just been mentioned. They could also be profitable, but they, there could be also some kind of structure that maybe if somebody does end up developing something for profit, but it benefits the entire ecosystem, then once that profit hits, maybe there should be some kind of return to the treasury because yes. realistically right now, it's just being completed as well. Yeah. So, I mean, there could definitely be some kind of investment structure, so to speak. And I also don't see anything negative about that because at the end of the day, if the project succeeds, that means it keeps bringing back money to the treasury. Um, and I think that's a great thing because then you can fund other projects, right? So, um, I, I'm all in favor for uh, supporting a project, but they have to ha have some kind of aspects of a common good. That's That will be kind of my um, ultimatum, so to speak, because uh, it, it has to be beneficial for everyone because it does come from the treasury and like the relay chain is shared security. So that's the whole point. Like it ha we have to bring something that brings us all together in some way as well. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you there, Zylo, especially, you know, on the idea if a revenue model, if the revenue exceeds, you know, maintenance of whatever was built, then a payback is a really, really good idea there. Um, I'll also add, like, I feel the, the one sticking point I have with this, and it's kind of a similar uh, sticking point I had with uh, Rich's GMI proposal is like we use these words like grassroots, right? But then it's like, it's grassroots, but we also need half a million dollars uh, without any proof of what we can do, right? And like, okay, like, do you, you want to build a parachain? Why don't you try building something with smart contracts or on Wasm first? Why don't you build something that works and provides value? So, you, yeah. you know, why don't you actually grow from the roots instead of, you know, starting with the, you know, the sunflower up top? Um, people need to take reputation 
on this social layer seriously. Yeah. And reputation is the strongest currency, but it takes time to stack. So that's what I that's what I'm seeing here. You know, you okay? Your unknown team. You want to make a pair chain? Uh, okay. Well, you can try, but why don't you build something that works first and show us what you got? Yeah, and that, that's that's extremely important. And that's kind of why when we've defined these guidelines, one of the most important points we've set is depending on which treasury you're going to, you need to have a running chain there. So if you're going for the Kusama treasury, you need to define, you need to show not only your social proof, but you need to validate your work. You have something that works and it has already connected to the chain because then you've, you've demonstrated not only your capability, but your expertise and your your ability to execute. So that's one. And another thing is when it comes to ensuring you're delivering the value to the ecosystem, part of the guidelines is how does this deliver value to the ecosystem? How, how do you, how, how does the treasury benefit? Right. If this means getting users, fine. Let's define metrics around. Yeah. Let's put numbers to it, so we have accountability. Accountability is core to these guidelines. Yeah, it's a big discussion in the dis- direction channel this week is about defining metrics of success, and I'm I'm all for that for sure. Yeah. Okay. Really interesting. Yeah, first, yeah. Go ahead, Zara. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah. So that first application from somebody that's not that familiar is like the biggest kind of can of worms. So within order, we're going to try to somehow address it. But like that kind of ground zero, everything else, like you can develop the system of credentials, but that first step has to be some kind of like, (laughs) how do you say, give people something, you either give people the benefit of the doubt and you really do your own due diligence. I'm really in favor of using prediction markets for this, by the way. Um, I think we need to incentivize people to do research. (laughs) Uh, on certain things and uh, right now that's personally the only kind of solution that I have that goes beyond like I know you <laughs> trust me that's beyond trust me bro yeah I, I, I feel like people's fixation with a budget is equally correlated to how much trust me bro is in the proposal right <laughs> um, you know what that being said Zylo I, I'm definitely in favor of like defining some sort of like take a chance amount, like, you know, 5,000, 10,000 amount, you know, where you just give people that first opportunity uh, to, to try something out and show us what they have. And then the other option is to like reward people through tipping after they build something. That's the other way too. So results-based introduction to the treasury. Yeah. I think also um, there is during a bear market a scarcity mindset and I mean, because the Kusama treasury used to be like <clears throat> over a hundred million dollars in there. Um, now it's like a tenth of that. So uh, I think the Pokedex and the, I don't know if that's being deployed on state mine. I know it is on statement, but the the swap, the swapping decks, um, if that's available to Kusama, I think, I think there's a lot of really cool solutions that you could do with uh, like bounties made in stable coins. Uh, yeah. which might be, you know, curated by, uh, you know, a trusted entity to projects that are trying to build. And so that way we don't have to give projects, you know, a huge lump sum of money. Um, we can trickle funds as needed. And if they're delivering, um, then uh, then they, they can continue getting those funds. So, um, so yeah. Sam, uh, you, you lit up there. What's, uh, <laughs> what's got you? <laughs> That's exactly what we're building at Imbira, right? Yep. It's master based with accountability. It's ensuring that you get funds when the people you, who funded you vote the progress through. It's absolutely a need. We we have to do it. And and and, and I really wish that more chains uh, uh, went down this route of you know what we'll we'll take the risk. We'll take it away from the community. We'll take it away from the investors. But it's it's a very tough road. It's a very tough road to actually put your foot ahead then say i'm taking that risk and i'm going to build this something in in the highly likelihood that it might fail but at least i protect people and then we have we not we need that process in place where like now that you've delivered something now you have a proof of concept or a demo and you can actually show something working what where to go from there is this something the community or the the ecosystem wants fair enough if it's not then yeah, we can just say no one got hurt. 
right? And 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 if more teams went through this, the polka dot ecosystem will be extremely um, uh, united, more so than uh, I'd say we are now. The only thing I'll say to that is what I'm I, I'm I'm getting more into bounties and the idea of bounties. So the one thing I'm wary about bounties is centralization, right? So like there needs to be some sort of mechanism to replace the curators, uh, so the curators don't become uh, like permanent fixtures just based on being there first. I think that's kind of yeah yeah. Um, oh, I wonder if there's a a governance solution to that. What if there is a tract like a bounty curator are, tract? Well, what I can tell you is what we are working on. Right, we're well, we're working on this decentralized fellowship of similar to what Gov Two does, but it's uh, we're we're building this freelance marketplace where people can define an idea and this is where the bounties come into play look i want someone to build something for me uh it could be something on the ui it could be like a blog it could be a video it doesn't matter what you want you want some item of work done and you've got this decentralized fellowship of people who have qualified each other to now be able to apply for that piece of work and the bounty becomes the pay for that piece of work and then you're only getting vetted and qualified individuals no, it's not exactly like the current fellowship where only the fellowship are able to add more people to it. It'll, it'll be allowing more people to apply to the fellowship, but then the community themselves can add someone who has demonstrated her, his or her qualifications. So the fellowship just keeps on growing. And I'd like to think of it as a decentralized union because then we, they as a union can say, actually, you're defining this bounty and it's actually far too low to the current cost. Like the cost of a substrate developer is anywhere between 120 to $300,000 a year. So when you have a bounty to say, Hey, write me some rust for three months and I'm paying you 4,000 or $5,000 a month. That's nowhere near what the real value is. So that's what we're hoping to build out this decentralized fellowship to, to actually ensure that you have qualified embedded individuals that can apply and and follow through on that bounty yeah and um you know we'll move on to, to adam's conversation here but just real quick people are wondering if you can define any difference between imbue uh polymec which is uh, back on the scene and uh Kabocha. Yeah. yeah so for us for imbue we wanted to qualitatively ensure that people vote on the milestone so you it could be any piece of work so uh, we were originally going to do the crowdfunding route where someone can say, hey, I'll have an idea. I want funding. Oh, right? yeah. I don't want to go to the country for this. Uh, but with the bear market, we've, we've pivoted slightly towards this, this freelance marketplace. And it's ensuring that items of work. With Polymec, I think what they're working on is credentials and they're going down that legal route. Kabocha is kind of a mix of all things. I can't really define it right now. Um, but for us, it's we're very, very clear on it's decentralized governance on tasks on ensuring that work is done and validated and people vote on that progress and everything's done on chain. So we have a very clear idea of what the product is and who our personas or users are. Right. So the very first freelance group or organization on Imbue is actually going to be an Imbue team. So we're going to reach out to other chains and say, Hey, you want some substrate work done, or you want some web three work done, or if you want some designs done, we can utilize the expertise and allow people to monetize their skill sets. Absolutely. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thanks a lot for that clarity. And also just want to say that the chat is fire right now. We love you guys very much. Uh, just to close out this, um, Zylo, uh, I'm just curious if you have a comment to close out here because you know, you're working on these problems as well. Okay, so uh, I think that we need uh, smaller designs within this whole governance design, <laughs> if I can put it simply in those terms. So we need to design the credential system for the delivery that's mentioned, but I, we also need to design these, well, create these maybe sub DAOs or curators for certain things. I still am emphasizing the importance of relevance um, and I think that this is one of the bigger issues that we have. And therefore, I think we need something like we have the fellowship as, uh, you know, Sam mentioned, like they're doing their fellowships, <laughs> if I can call them like that. Um, and I think we need more of these groups, which can chime in on like specific things. And um, we can trust them that 
they're good at what they do, but then you need a whole mechanism of how these people change within that group. Because as mentioned, you can't always have the same people uh, in there because that's, uh, I mean, that's not really democracy either <laughs> anymore. But yeah, that's, so there, there's quite a few things there. And uh, I think um, a lot of people need to try to design these things and deploy them. And because until we do that, it's all going to be speculation. Yeah. Um, because this is, um, all of these things are theories. And uh, one thing that I will say is that I'm tired of even talking about these things. Uh, so like, it's good to keep working on them <laughs> rather than talking about them. But yeah, I, I'm, it's exciting to see more people talk about this because it is, uh, I think it's one of the core issues of society in itself. But if the solution to that could bring, could result in um, designs of completely new social uh, and political systems. Hell yeah. All right. Sorry, thanks. I went a little bit too deep. No, no <laughs> it's perfect depth. Uh, and that delivers us right to uh, Adam Stieber's uh, discussion here. So this is, you know, a little bit more uh, specific to uh, this is kind of an edge case here. So this is funding implementations of common good parachains. Uh, you guys have the Green Bay dollar. And uh, maybe you could just give us a quick overview. Well, first of all, tell us about um, what is this parachain called again? Cool. Incointer. Incointer, yeah. Tell us a bit about uh, what Incointer does and then the Green Bay dollar and then kind of the crux of your discussion here. Sure. Well, I just learned today from Wemo when he said that they're called systems parachains. Right. You know? Oh. That's, that's cool. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but yeah, it used to be called Common Good, uh, but now I guess they're systems. So, uh, Incointer is really, really neat, in my opinion. Um, yeah. I learned about them when they launched. Uh, when they got their uh, common good parachain slot. And uh, it's kind of been just on my mind since then. So what they uh, what they have is essentially, they've created a protocol where any community in the world can um, bootstrap a local digital currency. And the way it works is that every 10 days, um, users uh, will register for a, uh, a ceremony or a meetup, or they call them gatherings. And it's a proof of personhood protocol. So you show up and uh, at noon uh, local time, and this happens on uh, you know throughout the world. So everybody shows up uh, at their local community, and they attest each other's per personhood by scanning each other's devices. So uh, you each take turns. You vote on the number of attendees at your meetup. You scan each other's devices, and then you submit those attestations on chain. And then uh, once the attestation phase uh, completes, everybody is guaranteed a universal basic income in the uh, in the local digital currency. So for the Green Bay area, <clears throat> we have the Green Bay dollar. Uh, in Zurich, they have uh, LEU or LU is the lion's share. Um, and they've uh, been they've been going on for, I think, over a year now live uh, live net. But they've been working on that community for three years now. So uh, it's really cool because, um, well, Zurich and the Green Bay area, definitely in first world countries, uh, there was a, uh, a community in Rwanda that was unfortunately purged because they, had, they were too inactive, but they're talking with the community leaders there uh, to get them back on their feet. But, <clears throat> but uh, for those second and third world countries, it can actually help to mitigate hyperinflation, uh, political corruption, um, or even just uh, not having access to uh, a fiat currency because the infrastructure just isn't there. So um, there's a lot of humanitarian angles that you can take within Coiner. Uh, even in first world countries, uh, you know, if you if you get donations, you can, for instance, pay up front a uh, you know uh, for produce at you know a farmers market or a grocery store, and in exchange, you tell these uh, businesses, hey except GBD up to the amount that we're paying up front. And then uh, Incoiner can act as a, uh, a regulatory mechanism for uh, a program like this. And so it can help, you know, literally feed people or even uh, help just with the barter and trade systems that are a little bit more disconnected from society. So mm -hmm. uh, I believe in it. Obviously, the ecosystem believes in it. Their last funding request received, they received, uh, what was it, like 20,000 KSM? 
and it was unanimous unanimously in favor there was not a single nay vote for them and uh, all the best because they definitely deserve the funding and i definitely believe in the project which is why i'm implementing it uh that's why you know that's why i'm here to discuss this right so you guys started a local currency uh called the green bay dollar and I just want to say, I really love this project, too. Um, I, I have a personal idea for it, which I, I'll do once I, anyway, in years. But uh, yeah. I think it's very yes. cool. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, it's, sure. So we, uh, so like I said, this has been on my mind for probably over a year since they got it. Yeah. Uh, got their pair chain slot. And uh, we just, uh, <clears throat> we just recently launched. So our launch day, our bootstrapping event was on the 7th. So brand new, just about two weeks in, and uh, but it's been about three or four months in the making. And uh, so we go to our local library, we've held informational sessions, we got a few community members to be our bootstrappers, and now we're just trying to find businesses uh, to adopt the Green Bay dollar and um, users to uh, mint it. And so the challenge is, is that we have to bootstrap the entire way uh, because it's kind of hard being that first business to say, yes, I'll accept this. Right. Um, the, the value statement for businesses in the area. So we're not really targeting corporate businesses or franchises. Really. We're looking at locally owned small businesses. And the value statement is that these small businesses, if they accept green Bay dollar, um, they're tapping into a direct local market of consumers, um, who have a vested interest in spending GBD because they show up every 10 days. Uh, our nominal income is 35 GBD. So uh, every 10 days you get 35 GBD. So it's not, I mean, it's not a huge amount, right? So you're not gonna bankrupt the local economy um, by accepting this. And um, the more users there are, the bigger this direct marketing front is. And so businesses can kind of, small businesses can leverage this technology and the users as a way to uh, get their brand out there and to be recognized. The hard thing is you, you need a user base to do that. So we're trying to think of ways, uh, clever ways to, um, you know, get people on board to get, because our goal right now is to get GBD in the hands of as many people as possible, because then that increases the value statement for small businesses to accept it. And we also, we're not expecting any business to accept GBD in replacement of USD. Uh, you, GBD is not supposed to uh, replace the dollar. Um, it's supposed to supplement it. And so an example is you could pay 5% of your bill with GBD um, and then the rest with USD. So you give these people kind of a discount. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of our goal. And uh, we're, we're working hard to, uh, to bring it alive, which is um, what sparked this discussion. Because you are, you're looking to offset, or you're looking to onboard businesses by kind of uh, offsetting the GBD with actual USD. Is that is that what's going on here? Yeah. So yeah. the the incentive for consumers is that they get a discount at a local store. They get to you know experience something new. We've definitely because my wife she uh, she flyered at like 150 local businesses, and she learned so much about like the small business culture here in Green Bay. So people can really learn about, you know, supporting local businesses and they also get a discount at these places because if they accept GBD, then, um, then that's a discount. And then the question is what do these businesses do with GBD as they accumulate it? Uh, and what's really cool is well, small businesses can't really afford a rewards program. Uh, so take for instance, like, you know, you got your Starbucks stars or like your Chipotle points. That actually takes a lot of like technical infrastructure to keep all those ledgers and balances. Sure. And Coiner handles all of that on the blockchain. So businesses can leverage the blockchain ledger as a rewards program. So you can reward GBD to customers who don't pay in GBD. So you can distribute it to your customers as a loyalty program, or you can distribute it to your employees as a sort of bonus on top of their uh, regular pay. So businesses, you know, while you probably won't be able to purchase your inventory with GBD, you can actually redistribute it to help retain your employees and customers. Okay, so I'm just trying to get to, to the crux of this discussion here. It's like you, right. you're paying for those discounts with Kusama treasury funds that are already part of the Encointer treasury, like Encointer bootstrap program or whatever. And you're asking, should we be using Kusama treasury to like bootstrap like a local currency like this? Is that right? Kind of. So the, the general discussion would be 
so take for instance you know what what are systems parachains what are common good parachains and how should we fund those right because for gbd implementing gbd is uh, it takes a lot of time and it, it's costly so we've you know printed flyers we have to book rooms we have to buy snacks and food for our meetups and everything and there's actually no real revenue model for the green bay dollar okay. so for this specific implementation you know we're not going to list gbd on any exchange that's not what it's meant for it's not meant to be a speculative asset and i mean other than seeking donations this is truly a nonprofit endeavor and so as a business, you know, Steber Solutions, like we're trying to bootstrap this community so that it becomes autonomous. Eventually we want to hand it off to the Green Bay community once it is at that level, but we can't forever keep doing this, right? So mm. the idea, the question is for projects like this, um, and it doesn't have to be in Coiner, it could be implementations on state mine or, you know, whatever else comes along on uh, Kusama's system parachains. Um, to what extent should we fund these projects using treasury funds? Um, and so I bring up a specific example on really boosting our marketing strategy for Green Bay Dollar uh, by putting billboards up uh, around the area for a year. Um, and so that's one example. Uh, and I mean, we are funded a little bit by Incoiner and those funds are going a lot of way, uh, a lot, a long way. And those funds came from the treasury. But if we really want to, um, you know, step up, you know, the, the adoption rate here in Green Bay, we really do need kind of a larger marketing front um, to establish kind of the legitimacy, legitimacy of the project. Hmm. Okay. So, so to make it more general, I believe, so I'm more than willing, recognizing that this is a common good pair chain, I'm more than willing to spend the time and effort for free. So all the time and effort that I spend towards GBD is volunteer work. And I don't think it would be sustainable if we said, let's fund, you know, every single common good, good parachain implementation all the way down to the hours worked. I think that would be quite unsustainable because if you look at a lot of the funding requests from the treasury, uh, the, I mean, most of them are just time and effort uh, expenses, which is, I mean, it's expensive to employ people, obviously. Um, so for me, I believe that time and effort spent in implementing a common good parachain is, should be volunteered, but as far as like, you know, necessary marketing efforts, uh, materials, infrastructure, just those costs should be covered, you know, at cost. So I think that nobody should really be making money implementing these things, but they should be able to implement them and, uh, and buy the necessary materials and infrastructure to implement them without having to pay out of pocket. Mm. That's my opinion. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, for me, it, it's still quite simple. I've always seen common good chains, not as not as charity chains, but chains for the benefit of the underlying token. So it, it comes down to the same thing we were talking about before. Just for me personally, um, there needs to be value flowing back into the token for every token spent. Um, and you know, framing requests for tokens through that. That's that's just for me. That's just for that's just what I think. But well, I don't know, uh, Limo, uh, Funky. Do you guys have any ideas on that? Maybe not. Go ahead, Lim. Uh, I think, well, I was just gonna say this. I mean, general comments. For one, I had no idea you were in Green Bay. Go pack, go. <laughs> Two, I'm a Vikings fan. <laughs> oh, well, that's, oh. that's a really interesting twist. <laughs> but still, I was thinking, like, if this actually got going, like, could you imagine? You, you should be targeting Lambo and seeing like, hey, can you adopt GBD? Can, I mean, th then the thing would really take off. But I mean, I think just the idea philosophically is really interesting. It's like a rewards program and using public infrastructure for those small businesses, right? right? Because like, this is a big concern we have across all of America. The small business owner is just constantly being gobbled up by large multinational corporations. So, I mean, I it just on a personal level, like I, I just applaud the idea and what you're trying to do. Um, I do think like to Jay's point, you know, how do you continually accrue value to the token to where it is going to be worth something is probably the bigger challenge. But, you know, I mean, just general kudos for even thinking about how to make an impact in your local community with with blockchain and crypto. And I, I think that in and of itself is really noteworthy, Adam. Thank you. Well done. Yeah, I second what Funky said. It's really cool what you're doing. Um, and I'm looking forward to future updates on them. 
Yeah, thanks. And uh, ultimately, yeah, Lambeau Field is our big target. Uh, we met one of the representatives who works there um, at a networking breakfast. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, get some, you know, Packer tickets, cheap Packer tickets available in GBD, hopefully. Um, but there's a lot of steps before that. Um, so, I, yeah, so, and I, I mentioned this in the discussion for this specific uh, example of putting up billboards, um, the value statement for Kusama is simply brand exposure. And I did mention in there that I don't think it's appropriate to slap up just Kusama branding on billboards anywhere because it's a global protocol. Green Bay Dollar, however, is a specific, uh, a locale specific implementation of ultimately Kusama technology. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like an excuse to advertise Kusama in the Green Bay area. And so, and that's why, like, originally the billboard design only had Green Bay Dollar uh, branding on it. And then I'm like, no, we should definitely include all of the underlying infrastructure. So the Kusama brand should be on there and the Encoiner brand should be on there. Uh, and if you go to the discussion, you'll see the design there. Um, and these are big billboards. It's 14 feet by 48 feet. Um, I have them in meters, too, for the European folks. Um, but the Kusama, the Kusama logo in this specific design would be printed seven feet wide. And so Kusama is definitely getting a lot of exposure here in Green Bay. And me as personally and as a business, you know, our goal in our Web3 side of our business is to bring this technology to society in ways that can actually help. And so if Kusama is at the forefront of implementing Web3 in the real world, uh, I think that's going to go a lot. It's going to go a long way in just getting people who aren't familiar with Web3, uh, you know, familiar with it. And what better way to introduce them to, you know, Kusama? Uh, I think that it's, you know, it's a great place, you know, to experiment things. And that's exactly why, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I love experimenting and trying new things. So that's cool, Adam. All right. Well, we we threw up the discussion there. We'll move on now. But thanks so much for coming on and and planting those ideas in our heads. I really do think in coins sure. is cool, and um, it's. Uh, I'm interested to see what you do with it. So thanks for coming on and, and everything. We're going to move on now, if you don't mind. Thanks very sure. much uh, to uh, the Safari uh, Polka Dot Safari 2023. 20, uh, guys, are you there, Georgia and Sonoy? Yes, we're here. Hi, welcome to the show, How's and thanks everyone? a lot for coming on. Thank you. I'm going to throw up uh, your proposal on the screen right now. And so why don't you just give us a quick rundown uh, where this conference is happening, when it's happening, what's going to happen at it, and how much you're asking to make it for to make it happen. Okay, so we are we planned to have it from the 30th to the 1st of April, so 30th March to 1st of April in Naivasha, Kenya, which is two hours from the capital city um nairobi uh we are expecting about 350 to 400 attendees just based out of our previous um eth safari conference that we hosted last year it's in september and um yes yeah, so we will have a bootcathon which is obviously a boot camp and a hackathon combined it will start online on the 6th of March and run through the 27th. And then from the 27th, we'll have it in real life at the venue in Naivasha. Um, and uh, then we'll start with the main conference on the 30th of um, uh, March. We actually had to push the date so that we could account for Paris Blockchain Week because a lot of the parachain teams um, uh, you know, would be in attendance there. So we yep. wanted to make sure that we'd be able to accommodate them. Awesome, yeah. Um, and you guys are looking for $281,000 worth of KSM, um, a hefty piece of the treasury to pull this off, right? Yes, it is actually a little bit higher now, um, but just roughly around 300000 worth of K KSM. Okay, and um, what's... Uh, I don't really know about the cost of throwing events in Kenya. What 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 what's kind of the big breakdown of the budget here? The three hundred thousand dollars worth. What are you guys spending that on? Uh, just if you just give me a second. 
Okay, so a big chunk goes to the venue itself. Um, there's the conservancy fee, there's um, accommodations. Uh, another big chunk also goes to the organizers themselves. And um, let's see what else. Entertainment, the entertainment budget, the scholars um, airfare. We are we plan to, to sponsor uh, polka dot ambassadors around Africa to attend this um, conference. Very important for us. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the, the boot cathon and prize pool as well. Uh, those are the main big, you know, chunks of this this budget. Okay, where, where's the boot cathon uh, line in the budget there? I'm trying to find it for our, our viewers. Okay. Um, do you mean on the proposal? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I can just post it in the... Well, it, it's below the conference agenda, if you can see that. Okay. Uh, Have you seen it yet? Not yet. I'll then find there's a link. I'll find it as, uh, as we continue talking. Any, uh, any questions from uh, other members of the panel about uh, what we've heard so far? There is a comment on YouTube asking why it's not in the capital city. Mm-hmm. Okay, right. That's a good question. So Safari Dao um, prefers, or we, you know, we embody the essence of groundedness. We want to embody that the same way uh, its safari was held in Kilifi, which is by the coast. On a, you know. Um, we want to continue the barefoot networking theme that prevailed at Eat Safari. Um, it was very grounding and was surrounded by nature. And um, it, it's just, it, it makes it easier for people to really engage and, um, you know, connect with each other rather than in Nairobi where there's so many distractions. It's easy to just go off uh, during the day and, you know, get lost or, you know, in something else. So, yeah. Those are the main reasons. Cool. Uh, anybody else? I'd also just Sorry, like go ahead. add yeah. that. I'd just like to add that um, I this initially was conceptualized by Urban um, of Parity. I had approached him just right after ETH NYC last year to sponsor for Polka Dot to sponsor ETH Safari, and he, you know he was. Obviously, he said that that would be very interesting, but he proposed that we actually um, organize a polka dot centric uh, conference at that time. Uh, so that's actually how it was conceptualized, which is very interesting. And I think um, interesting for you all to know as well. Awesome. And you yeah, and- go ahead. Go ahead, Georgia. So, yeah, uh, if I can add on that. Uh, we've been, ever since the end of Eat Safari, we've been, uh, Siano, you mentioned how we start working on Polkadot Safari and we've been steering towards this. We've built um, a community around this. Uh, I think some of the guys, if you could check out our Discord, uh, maybe if I can get the link there. Yeah, we have engaged so many people. We have, uh, for the Bootcathon, we're targeting around 200 devs and so far, we, we are almost maxing out the signups, and um, this is one of those uh, conferences that's supposed to bring together the larger Web3 community. Yeah, there's a Discord in the chat. Bring together the larger Web3 community in Africa and engage them. And this is uh, one of the opportunities that we spot to bring more people into Polkadot. I've seen how Polkadot is growing really fast, even in the Asian community. And I'm seeing this as a chance for Africans to get on top of this and also build meaningful solutions. Uh, We've seen a a crypto winter around the world, but uh, from stats, uh, you can see that Africa is one of the fronts where investment in startups has not flowed and we're hoping to see this across blockchain startups as well and um, sponsoring this event is one of the things that will 
give rise to the builders that we are looking for to build on top of native chains and enable these solutions to go and bring uh, on board the next billion people into a tree. And this is not just a buzzword that we keep on hearing. Africa has the population, it has the youth, we have the internet connectivity, we have Starlink right now, uh, we have phone penetration, and we have a lot of tech talent. So this event goes a long way into orienting the community and giving rise to uh, a new generation of builders that is similar to what we saw from the aftermath of Peak Safari and Polkadot Safari should even be bigger. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for that, man. Um, so uh, I, I ask all these questions in good faith because I don't know anything about throwing events. But um, it looked like a two-day event, but you guys have the venue for six days. Is that because the hackathon's like a few days before the official event or, or something like that? Yes, the in, real, the in real life hackathon is um, from that Monday and then the Thursday is when the conference starts. Okay. And... Um, like I said, I don't know about like, like costs in Kenya, but but these are normal costs, like sixty one thousand dollars for venue amenities for the six days, and and twenty two thousand dollars for six days of the venue. Th these are this is what it costs, eh? I typically I also haven't really hosted many events in Kenya, but uh, based out of Eat Safari, yes, this is this is um, what to expect. We didn't really we're not really um renting out uh like a building per se but it's like a really large venue to accommodate people and we're building structures and, and you know customizing the experience for our attendees as well uh, rather than having a very corporate feel that's not you know that it's not really our you know style so you guys are taking a big chunk mm -hmm. of land and building structures and amenities on it for this event is that right Basically, we are, um, uh, there's already a parcel of land, like it's called Sanctuary Farm, actually, the venue. Yep. And, you know, they, they actually have a variety of animals on land. And it's it's, it's just very nature-esque and um, wild-esque as well. Uh, so this is how much it costs to um, rent the land as well. Okay, interesting stuff. Um, I'll Thanks very much for coming on. Do, do we have any other questions from the panel um, before we move on? Go ahead, Ryan. No, no question. I just wanted to comment um, just broadly for the same reason that I love Dot India, I love Dot Safari. Right. right. I mean, think about the global population and where all the youth is, where all the brain is right now, India and Africa at the top of that list. And if we can get a presence and a foothold there and attract these young, vibrant minds to blockchain industry in general, but Polkadot in particular, even better. Um, so, you know, I just hope that this all goes off without a hitch and it's a great event. And, you know, that because uh, I think both of these are going to serve us well in the long run. I agree with Funky. That's why I'm going to attend Dot Safari. So I'll see you guys there. Yes, Karibuni, which means uh, you're all welcome. <laughs> Love to have you. Cool, guys. Well, good luck with the proposal. You're in discussion phase now. Any uh, idea when you're going to put it on chain? Yes, our plan is to submit that proposal uh, either tonight or tomorrow, inshallah. Okay. <laughs> Best of luck. We'll, uh, we'll check up on it next week. Thanks very much for coming on the show. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Georgia. So, oh, who's stepping up here? Hey, Kwasi, what's up? Hi, hello. How are you doing? Good, good, sir. Uh, introduce yourself. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to be sorry. I was a bit caught up uh, with the Nairobi and traffic, but uh, I wanted to make it here, and finally I've made it here. So my name is Kwasi. I'm uh, personally, career-wise, I'm a security and software dev. I'm also a co-contributor for the uh, hackathon and the bootcamp that is going to be hosted by Safari DAO. Ah. And yes, uh, I'm glad to be here and uh, meet you guys. 
Okay, great. We're, we're actually just going to move on from the Safari DAO there. But uh, maybe just in two minutes, just tell us um, what you're excited about uh, presenting at, at the Safari uh, hackathon there. Yeah, uh, thank you again. Uh, so uh, with the Safari DAO, uh, what actually I'm more interested in doing, I'm working with a colleague uh, called Jerob in actually uh, bringing the learners together, uh, having a, a system and a framework where we can trace and uh, uh, host them for a two-week online <coughs> bootcamp on Polkadot. Uh, uh, we have been able to uh, garner around uh, 200 developers registered already, and uh, we are planning to have this uh, Polkadot uh, bootcamp that we're going to run uh, for two weeks online. Uh, with the trainers who are from uh, uh, a training center, uh, a blockchain training center from Kaja called uh, ABC. And uh, with that said, uh, we are also planning to have uh, a five day hackathon and we'll try to streamline some of the learners directly from the bootcamp into the hackathon uh, where we, they can actually try uh, to, uh, you know, uh, build using the knowledge they have already learned from the bootcamp that they're going to have in two weeks. Um, we are also uh, planning to bring in uh, different parachains. I, I think I've talked with Limo a lot uh, on the Discord. Uh, we are trying to bring in the parachains and see how they can participate in uh, this hackathon. Uh, we we are we have come up uh, with different packages uh, uh, for different uh, parachains on how they can actually sponsor and have. Uh, a, a, a part, you know, have a slot on how they can, you know, participate in this hackathon. Yeah, yeah. So far, so good with the registration, uh, and we are pretty much positive. We are uh, we are aiming at around 400, 500 learners, since we also uh, want to, uh, you know, onboard these parachains that we want more devs to be on board. Yeah. So currently, we are, you know, we are actually uh, emphasizing on how we are going to bring in more uh, developers to actually uh, register, register in this uh, for this event, yeah. Radical. All right, thanks a lot, Kwasi, for coming in and uh, sharing that with you. Like we said, we're going to check up on it next week and see how the token holders are taking it. Thanks very much for coming in. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, so moving on here, um, other things happening in governance. We have the OpenGov dashboard treasury proposal just about to pass. This should be uh, this should be passed by this time next week. Uh, we also have uh, oh wait, I wanted to show you guys something weird. Oh yeah, so I guess on the in governance one we had somebody trying to change a piece of the runtime code to just a bunch of random text or something. Anybody have any knowledge on what was going on here? Did he change it to something like, yeah, I can see on the screen, he said, expect chaos. So I guess it's just somebody messing around, right? Yeah. But if nobody was paying attention, would have that just happened or what? No. That'd be real chaos. I believe the uh, <clears throat> the legacy governance doesn't work anymore. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if you can get referenda passed on there anymore. Oh, because really? isn't that what they isn't that what they tried to do when Gov2 yeah. came out and then they were like, oh, it's broken. And then they had to do it through Gov2 tracks. Because so, I think the legacy governance lost all of its teeth, I believe. Yeah, I think that was part of the auctions problem. They tried to do it through auction admin and then it didn't work. So they tried to do it through Gov1 and it didn't work. And then yeah. they realized they need to do it off a route. <laughs> and, uh, it takes a long time and it's quite expensive deposits. Right. Well, I'm curious, I mean, what, and I've thought of this before, like, what if uh, the runtime changes to like a hello world and that's it? Like, how could we recover the chain? It, would it be possible? I guess you'd have to do an, I don't know. you'd have to do an off chain organization of, of, of the validators, right? And you'd have to like get everyone to agree to start the old chain basically. Yeah. Well, isn't there, there's like a section in Polkadot.js where it says like hard forks, like oh. there are such thing as hard forks, I believe. Hmm. Um, yeah, if you go to the Explorer and go to the forks tab, uh, it says, you know, zero forks. So I think 
Hmm. Kusama does have fortune potential. So if it ever does get broken, I'm sure like, you know, I'll, I'll definitely, you know, run whatever code that parody comes up with. You know, I, as we're speaking, I'm building the, you know, new, uh, the new, um, client for, uh, validating. So, um, so yeah, if that ever happens, I'll, I'll definitely be part of that off chain organization. It'll be a hell of an AAG episode for sure. <laughs> so, so some other stuff going on in the eco, um, that Wasm smart contract bounty is, um, just about, just about finished there. Um, that's going to pass soon, but then we need to, uh, in it, uh, we need to, um, put in the curators. So I don't know how long that takes on Polkadot, but, um, maybe that could take a really long time. We'll see about that. Talisman is opening up a discussion on Polkadot to build a beautiful, intuitive, and user-friendly state mind Dex UI. Um, so that would be interesting. I did hear that internally, Parity is calling it dot swap uh, off of <laughs> off of C Saints <laughs> polls on Twitter. So that's some success there. Um, it's nice to include the the community. And um, yeah, that's basically kind of all I had lined up for today. Is there anything else anybody else on the panel wanted to discuss before I, I throw it to a final discussion? Go ahead, Vaughn. Yes, I. I did want to, as emissary for the Lucky Friday team, provide an update. So I know one of the things that we're trying to do for uh, teams who take, you know, and get any kind of funding from the treasury is to have them back on AAG so they can discuss updates. So I just wanted to kind of give a broad update. Now, we already posted an update on the actual proposal, which I shared in Chaos Dow. Like it was probably maybe on Valentine's Day that um, my colleague Mark had added some text to the ongoing piece for the RPC provision that we were doing back in late November. Mm -hmm. So just so everyone's aware, the biggest sort of hiccup we ran into was procurement related. Um, obviously with the timing of us ordering the RPCs and it was around the holidays, this delayed us by roughly eight weeks in terms of getting in the hardware, but now we're catching up. So we're still a little behind obviously, but we're catching up quickly. And so some interesting updates that I want to share, and I'm sorry, I'm going to have to look at notes because Will just gave me all this great information that there was no way I was going to retain because I don't have the technical capacity to really even understand what he's getting at. It is. Um, so, um, but just so you guys know, all of the new servers have been installed and racked. They're powered up. We had to also wait for a third party just to kind of inspect the physical devices to make sure everything was good to go. Um, we are currently running, I guess, two by 20 uh, gigabyte channels that are coming into the rack. So we have really great speeds. Um, they tested, so um, they tested, I guess, like a, a fail out to just test that capacity. And so they, they wanted to make sure that each server was doing everything. They found one, I guess, port on a switch that they had to swap out. So everything is good on that regard. And apparently what they're really looking to do is like for the next one to two weeks is test everything. They're doing multiple instances of VMs on these different servers. And then eventually, hopefully we're gonna get to a point where we're gonna invite the community to kind of stress test all of this before we take this. Cause we're kind of getting up to like a pre-production point where we can have the community to say, okay, go ahead. Why don't you just slam our RPCs? and see if you can slow them down. Um, and that's, so that'll be the next phase. And so once we get to that, uh, theoretically, we will be back on on March 6th. For, so this, you could consider sort of the penultimate update, if you will, and you're gonna get the final update from Will himself because he could explain a lot of this better. And my notes are far too messy <laughs> to really make sense of a lot of it. Um, but basically things are going exceedingly well. We're kind of picking up pace and uh, hope to have everything in place to support the Kusama you know, network really soon. When you say Will, you mean Paradox, right? Yes, Will, yes, I'm sorry, Paradox. No, yes. no, no, all good, because there's the other. Use his, his There's the his other Will, too. Though. Yeah, no, we miss Paradox. Paradox. It'd be good to have him back. So, uh, I don't know, I'll throw it to you, Adam, if you have any questions about that, because you probably know more <laughs> what's being said than I do. Sorry. No, uh, no, I, no questions here. It sounds all really cool. I didn't know you guys were building a server in infrastructure. So mm. hearing that the servers are racked uh, kind of excites me because excites me that's uh, 
that's a very exciting thing. <laughs> so I can share a picture. The, apparently, the guys that are all like the infra guys were going gaga for how sexy it looked. Apparently. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely post that. You know, there's what's that? There's like a subreddit called like chord management where you get all these like sexy like chords, you know, like all in ninety degrees and mounted on the wall. So yeah. <laughs> If I can find yeah. it, send us a pic of your rack. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, what's going on here? Okay, that's interesting. I just wanted to I wanted to ask you, uh, Funk, so you guys are like setting up these physical servers, right? And the idea is that other people, other people will be able to set up the same uh set up in other parts of the world is that the ultimate idea here or is it just servers that you guys are going to run yourselves that like these are these are rpc endpoints to support the various parachains that are running on kusama yeah so these just like when you go to js and you have a list of available rpc points you'll now see eventually once these go into production you'll see lucky friday as a, a place Another that option. you can connect the, the, the parachain, you know, once you're like selecting it on JS. Um, so this is just one of many. I don't know exactly where this particular rack was installed, um, but I know that it was, we, the guy who does our physical infrastructure, I, I don't know what I can and can't share about him from our team, but he is highly, highly, like he has a lot of expertise. He's been doing this for probably close to 30 years and is a data center expert. So I think that's why they were geeking out about the rack when he showed the picture of like, all right, it's all powered up. And people were like, oh my gosh, it looks so great. And I'm like, this just looks like a bunch of computers to me. <laughs> okay. Well, cool. this is really exciting. Uh, just to add one last comment, because as a validator myself, you know, I use v uh, VPS, you know, I use Vol or uh, Contabo and data center, a data, a local data center is something that I'm actually looking into because it really helps decentralize the network further. So if you have an RPC that is at a physical location, you're not using, you know, Amazon servers. You're not using Contabo servers. You you are literally creating a geographical node. So uh, having that physical infrastructure is, you know, really uh, paramount to decentralization. Yeah, we have operational presence in six countries, and we're I think scouting out some new locations now. Because that that like we're bare metal maxis at the end of the day, we want to have that physical footprint. We you know all of our data centers that we're currently using are SOC two compliant. We ourselves, Lucky Friday, is in the process of completing both our SOC two and CCSS audits like internally for our team, which most teams don't even bother with. So we're taking this all very 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 seriously. Cool, sounds good. Thanks very much for the update, Funk. And uh, we'll get Paradox on here in two weeks. You say. Yes, he said he should be on March 6th, and theoretically that'll be sort of the final update um, because that'll be the point where we're probably going to invite people from the community to kind of stress test the RPCs and make sure everything is up and running. But just like by the numbers from what I heard, apparently like the numbers that are blazing fast compared to like most of the others that are currently running. So again, it's all like I kind of like over my head a lot of times. I'm just like, all right, sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> but, awesome. Well, it's great that Paradox can get all this done while still being such a massive Wag Media maxi. Um, the dude does see. not sleep. I am convinced <laughs> he is like either a robot, a cyborg, or something. Like the man I operates know. on almost no sleep. Yeah, absolutely. Top contributor in the eco for sure. Who sleeps? Come on. Yeah, that's right, Limo. What is it? 2 a.m. for you, Limo? <laughs> I do. I'm old. <laughs> all right. Look, I just wanted to bring. Um, I, I wanted to bring up some ideas about this show. Uh, in the last few minutes and just get some feedback from you guys. Um, you know, people are really convincing me on ideas of bounties and stuff. And obviously, I think a weak point of this show is that, you know, it's run by the same people. And, you know, there's various centralization uh, risks and problems with that. So I'm kind of playing around with a, with a bounty structure that would do something like a common... Uh, like social media accounts, a common social media brand, you know, across YouTube and Twitter, but some sort of bounty system where anybody can start a show at up to, you know, $2,000 per show with an extra like 500 or something for like posting it on the social media channels, like distributing it. But you can, uh, uh, people can start a show, any governance-based show that they want, 
and they can get more and more of that two thousand dollars with consecutive shows so maybe you start with like 200 for the first show and then 400 and you can build it up and then also a structure within it of like consecutive hosts showing up as well that determines how much of that piece they get something like that um yeah that, that's what i'm thinking now so maybe aag will only be one show because obviously we need a totally other show for following up on proposals we need a totally other show you know just dedicated to proposals that are just coming down the line and things like that and i don't want to be a central point or i don't want anyone on this panel to be a central point to that so uh what do you guys think about those ideas or what, what do you want to add to them well i think that just as like you think about the consumers of this content um if if you're if there, if there are too many like different shows about governance i think it will be confusing to the average user like well, what's aag for what's this you know aag right. follow-up show what's you know so although we want to kind of move away from centralization there is some value in uh in having it under one brand. And that's what I like about WAG Media because it's like the WAG Media brand, but it's not like you have like a CEO. Uh, I mean, Jay, you're kind of the CEO, but it's it's more of a, you, you just you just stick around and do probably some of the most work. So, uh, so I think there is some value in keeping everything governance related under WAG Media as AAG. And then maybe we could curate the bounty for different hosts. I think if the bounty is there, yeah. uh, I think a lot of different hosts would step up and say, hey, if I can get paid 200 bucks to host this week, then for sure. Something like that. Um, yeah. I'll just say, because you brought it up, though, WAG Media has nothing to do with this show. And also, WAG Media is not supposed to be a brand, so WAG Media is just a, a common place. But this will be more clear in the next version of WAG Media, which is... Gotcha. WAG Media is really tooling to help people build a reputation, like super low barrier of entry, the idea, but... Yeah, it takes a while to gotcha. decentralize, but yeah. Anyway, I, I totally agree with you there. There needs to be some sort of common uh, direction for for all these governance shows. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I'd also love like a team to be creating like infographics for every referenda, so people get a quick glance, you know, on Twitter and stuff like that. Like, there's a whole project, stuff like that. There is a what was it, Coin Studios or something that they're doing like. Uh referendum audits yeah we're gonna have got funding for that yeah. yeah we're gonna have him on next week that's, that's an interesting project for sure yeah I, I love his comments on poke assembly they're really cool he's got those like kind of rating graphs yep uh funky what do you think i mean i like the idea i guess my question would be you know do we have enough people now who are watching sort of the broad-based AAG to where you're going to have people who will tune in for just, say, proposal review or, or whatnot. And I'm not saying that they won't. Yeah, I, yeah, I just don't know. Um, I mean, I see where you're coming from and the need to kind of parse this out because, you know, this way you could keep this show maybe a little bit shorter because sometimes we go really long or whatever the case may be. But, I mean, I think that there's – it also helps in the decentralization efforts. So, you know, it's not on you, right? Like that other people can kind of pick up the ball and run with it. Like when you mentioned the thing about just the infographics immediately, I thought of a couple of people from chaos Dow that were like, Oh, they'd both be great at this. Yeah. You know? So I know there are people who are in our community who could provide that service. It's just whether or not that could they do this in this kind of format? That's really, I guess the question that remains to be seen. That's the thing. Yeah. But I think, if it's incentivized people are going to show up and do it right and i mm -hmm. just think that the one thing you want to avoid is just not having the wrong people and that sounds terrible show up simply because it's incentivized of course right? of course yeah there needs to be some sort of process of onboarding a show and, and trying at a show or something like that but really what it comes down to is like con media as a service right so like you have proposals they need to reach people to discuss their idea so you need some sort of platform that's more accessible than just this same time every monday or something like that which is like pretty restrictive you know something like that media as a service something yeah and you could too like just um now I'm, my brain's you got me going but just you know like when the proposal review for instance that could be just a short youtube video that's you know yeah almost like what we're doing at the opening where we just kind of give the quick primer on like here's what's happening this is why it's important look into these 
and, and you know just make a short five minute video each week or something like that to go along with just another piece of the Kusamarian content or unless you make it a, a completely it separate brand separate, yeah, altogether yeah. where like, all the governance stuff is just under this new umbrella which is totally fine um but you know maybe you have some so just the difference in the length of the show instead of if you don't need a live stream you could just do a, a short update video exactly. that you could tune into and then maybe just say this for the broader conversations with people and projects teams you know who are putting forth proposals and so on and so forth you got it exactly more like the round table you know this this which i love i love this format yeah me too yeah not, not everything needs to be live like this right stuff can be a bit more like polished right like the um catch up with uh, the teams that have uh, had successful referendums that can be you, you know the actual conversation with them might be one hour long but the actual vid the end product could be 20 minutes long or 10 minutes long right mm -hmm. um it can be more digestible um because obviously this show is like quite long it's quite long farm right but we do cover quite a lot of ground i yeah. think because there's a lot to talk about whereas if we end up splitting it so that there's this kind of stuff we talk about in this show or some people talk about in this show we can kind of maybe trim down this show and make it more digestible as well um i think the experimentation is good either way to, to definitely give it a try cool yeah I, I see it on twitter like you know each referenda has its own thread which gets wider and wider the more you know content that you can stack there that's a little bit of reputation building as well isn't it so yeah Cool. Okay. Thanks for the feedback, guys. Still thinking about it. Maybe we'll get to 52 episodes of AAG before we do anything, but uh, it's always a great pleasure to be on here every Monday morning and to see all uh, your beautiful faces and hear your beautiful ideas. Adam, thanks for joining us. Um, it's always great when you show up as well. Thank you so very much. Yeah. If if I could just quickly throw out a crazy idea that I've had. That's what, Yeah. Hit us. Yeah. So we don't have to talk about it, but I just want to throw it out there. So when the Treasury burns funds... They actually don't get burned out of existence. They go to the society. I don't know if you guys knew that. So yeah. those funds aren't, uh, you know, they aren't being used necessarily in the society. And the society wallet has 119,488 KSM in it right now. So I was thinking of throwing a root track referendum on there on Gov2 to force transfer like 118,000 back KSM into the treasury from from the uh well there's two there's there's the treasury route right we just refund the treasury um but the more based route is to send it to the dead wallet to the zero x zero uh wallet and complete like truly burn the funds yeah um and you could do that with you know a set balance too where you could just set the society's balance to like a thousand ksm so that would be more based as like because those funds were burned so truly burn the funds um, but it could also be used to kind of, uh, you know, refund the treasury. So just yeah. some thoughts. I certainly don't have 3000 KSM to put the decision deposit down, but <laughs> I could definitely propose it. That was going to be my question. Is <laughs> right. Who knows? Maybe a VC will see it and be like, all right, cool. Let's do it. Uh, it is an interesting discussion though. Cause I have heard rumbles of people uh, wanting to stop the burn or this, you know, because the Kusama Treasury does have flat income now, pretty much. Uh, we are losing the Treasury every week, um, and we're not making it back anytime soon, it appears. So it is an interesting discussion. And uh, I do, Idea. as I understand it, the society, they, they don't have access to these funds. They, they would, and, and they, they do. The way it works is they, each week they have challenges, and you have mm -hmm. to, like, you have to prove that you have, you know, your tattoo or whatever. Yeah. And um, and then there's bids to enter the society, and then the lowest bid, you know, gets paid after a certain period of time. And yeah. then so that's what the the funds are being used for is to pay those bids. But the bids are so low. So I mean, low. You get yeah. People saying I'll I'll tap my body for six ksm. It's like holy shit. <laughs> like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so that that's kind of like inert. That ksm is like unless those yeah, bids no go way up. Yeah. There's no way they're going to use them, yeah. I don't think. Yeah, interesting discussion. We, 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 let's just pin that one for next week and for the coming weeks. Um, uh, that burn sure. is interesting, especially at this time when we're spending more than we take in. So um, mm -hmm. I'm going to call it there, guys. Thanks very much um, for coming in, and thanks very much to everybody in the chat. It was definitely fire today and, and informed a lot of our discussion. Um, so we'll hope to see you again soon. Uh, stick around the channel because we've got a lot of interesting projects or a lot of interesting content coming up. 
starting with an NFT episode on the Digi Diggers. Uh, these are people who are running around the Australian outback mining for opals, and they are uh, putting representation of those opals into NFTs, which can go into the metaverse. And also the Discovery Channel is filming the whole thing. So we have an episode on that. On Wednesday, we have an episode on Centrifuge and an update on their tokenomics, which should be pretty cool. Thursday on Sama Nights, we're getting Brain Dex in the room to talk about what they're doing and Dexes in general. Friday, another dump as usual. And then on Sunday, we're going to give you that Space Monkeys episode with Unit Network. Um, really excited to share this one. It's really unique and um, it just comes at building from a completely different angle. And so I hope you guys check that out when it comes out. Once again, thanks very much to our guests, guys, and uh, hope to see you again next week. Um, bye for now. See thanks, guys. Jay.